Today's Sambadhanam uh, podcast is with the multi-talented uh, Srimiti Anupama, a teacher in her own right, a phenomenal dancer and a research scholar, more importantly. Anupama, ka, just to start off today's topic, I wanted to sort of touch upon Bhakti and its relevance to dance today, not only to Kuchupadi, but to general traditional and performing arts. And perhaps from there, we can actually ask the question about what is traditional arts also. To start off, what do you think uh, is the relevance of bhakti in today's performing arts? Is it actually relevant? Um, is that something that uh, going forward, you think that it will actually propagate in performing arts? Or is it something that we'll relegate to the side in one or two pieces? Hi, uh, Mridula. I think to answer this question or to address this whole issue, I just want to discuss, you know, I, uh, what is the idea of bhakti in Indian terms when you look at it, because you don't have this idea of bhakti as such in any other culture. You have it. You had it in the Greek cultures. You had it in the Roman cultures. You have it in some of the other Asian civilizations. But the idea of bhakti as the what the word connotes, if you look at the word bhakti, it signifies several things in our culture. It is not only devotion that it signifies. Bhakti signifies faith. Faith is an idea that is prevalent in all cultures. See, the problem is we don't have a word in English which can actually describe what comes under the periphery of this word called Bhakti. Now, when we say the, for example, when we say the Bhakti movement, you know, which took place between the 11th and the 18th century, but almost for a span of 500 years. Now, what happened different then, which was not happening before, or which is not happening after. What happened differently then? You always had texts. You always had religion. You always had a quest for God. Or if you don't want to call it God, quest for something higher. You know, you always had this quest. The concept of bhakti took on a different dimension during the bhakti age. Because what was... A quest for God, which was something very abstract in the idea of, okay, I have a soul and this soul is looking for something higher to redeem itself, is not a concept easily understandable by a common person. So there's, there's a lot more that he needs to understand before he understands this soul concept of seeking union or being a seeker. So that is why Hinduism, to some extent, was losing its stronghold and you had Buddhism was becoming more popular around the 2nd century, 3rd century, you know, because of the simplicity of the formulas. It was very simplified. It was very, it was put down in a way that a common person felt that when they practice it, they could find some meaning in their life. That is how it was put down for them. And the whole Vedic concept of the Atman and the Brahman and the absolute truth was a little too abstract and it was a little too big for them. So th that is where, you know, Buddhism and Jainism became more popular because it was uh, like a practicing, practical guide to better living, like what you have today, the 14-minute guide to better living kind of a thing. So you did have that there. So when uh, Hinduism came back or revived itself, it came back with the idea of bhakti. Because that which was undefined, that which was called a nirguna or a formless parabrahma or a formless god, they started looking at this god with a form. Now this form is a saguna parabrahma. He has all the good qualities. So he, this god becomes your friend. He becomes your lover. He becomes your guide. He becomes your punching bag. This god become, becomes all of this. Now he has many gunas. Now, when he is good to you, you praise his gunas. When he is bad to you, you criticize his gunas. So, this guy becomes a friend. And this whole concept of having an Ishta Daiva or a beloved God of your own, who is your friend, whom you can talk to, this is how we have understood Bhakti actually. So, how can it ever be outdated? Because when you are, it is not simply about a ritual. It's not simply about praying to somebody, but it is about conversing and communicating with someone. 
and in that dialogue which takes place between you and the ishta daiva or you and your beloved god the audience is the third party who is enjoying that conversation and you are also involving him in the conversation ideally that is how it should be i mean if the conversation becomes only between you and the so called god then dance or music ceases to be a communicative process that it has to be a process of interaction between you this other friend of yours and the spectator who is watching what you are doing in this whole thing so communication has not changed over the centuries i mean the idea that you want to communicate today we say we are in a world a global world where communication has become a big thing so the concept of communication is not changed what you are trying to say through bhakti they are eternal values some of them that has not changed dharma piety has not changed even today the ideal would be that a person is honest to be a ruler that a person is a good leader that a person leads a life which is exemplary it is not happening that is beside the point the point is these are eternal values i mean piety or righteousness will never go out of fashion if you believe that that's what is required for a leader love every day left and right everyone's falling in love with everyone even today so it's not that love is an outdated idea so now these are all components of bhakti dharma is a component of bhakti something that is piety something that is righteous love is a component of bhakti not harming anybody or ahimsa or you know um working towards a better goal working towards re establishing that which is good that is a goal of bhakti communication is a goal of bhakti they are all components of bhakti so bhakti was not even considered a rasa actually you know in the times of the nat shastra it's only later when theorists like uh, ujwala you know who rupa goswami who wrote uh, texts like ujwala nilamani or bhakti rasamrita sindhu and this kind of text that was the first time that bhakti came under discussion and interestingly the idea that we have of bhakti today is not at all what they how they conceived it they said bhakti is of five kinds bhakti is the mother's love for a child they called it vatsalya bhakti they said bhakti is the love of a you know a servant to a god like you have the hanuman thing towards rama it's like it's not exactly a servant but a subservient person who looks up to your master or to a boss or to a lord and then you have the love of a younger sibling to the older sibling this was one aspect of bhakti the love of between a man and a woman also came under bhakti it came under ujwala shringara or it came under ujwala bhakti so there were five six components through which they defined bhakti and none of those components stressed on either praying or on ritual ritual and unfortunately today we have understood the concept of ritual in a very wrong manner we think ritual is something which is dogmatic which is full of you know you have to buy this you have to offer coconuts you have to offer this you have to offer that but that is only the outer aspects of a ritual that we see but a ritual is actually a very necessary aspect to anything you see a cricketer you see a sportsman you see an artist what they have a ritual to psychologically prepare them before going on to an arena a place where they practice their craft before they go there they, there is a ritual when greek drama used to be staged there used to be an entire ritual for the masks before you put the mask on because the ritual is a way of prepping the mind psychologically prepping the body to be able to assume another character in that context actually ritually world in ancient art forms whether it's greek chinese japanese indian or, or even persian all art forms start with ritual we are always holding the wrong end of the stick today we are thinking bhakti is only about saying the name of god and you know only praying to god we are understanding ritual wrongly we are saying it's all dogmatic and this is all you know all about you know pujas and homams and things like that we are just understanding the words and the connotations completely wrong bhakti is important it will always be important because it's like an anchor it's an anchor that gives you faith to perform certain activity bhakti does not necessarily mean only to god 
bhakti means to anything you may not be doing rituals but if you are constantly if you are practicing a craft or an art form that's your form of meditation how is bhakti irrelevant if you look at bhakti in the context of a faith or a system of faith in order to execute an activity to its fullest potential if that is what bhakti is doing for you then how is it irrelevant how will it ever become irrelevant also the reason why we are not able to execute things to the fullest today and we have mediocrity everywhere is because of lack of bhakti or lack of able to focus on an idea so completely till that idea consumes you that is what bhakti did it consumed the person who was actually practicing it so if something doesn't consume you and you are you are able to be a multitasker and like what but somebody who can do many and then when is the time for you to get consumed by something so in that context bhakti is completely irrelevant because if you do not have the time and if you are just this great person who does 10 things in a day and thinks that that is giving you optimum benefit then bhakti is not for the modern mind in fact uh, that i completely agree in the sense that this never with the bhakti where there are different kinds of bhakti and as you mentioned each is actually a different kind of bhakti it could also be uh, as a, you said the mother it could be uh, you know uh, you know somebody praying multiple kinds even to god it's also a question of as you say it's almost like a passion right exactly so the passion has to consume you to you be completely immersed in what you do you think if you do you think that apple could have been created without bhakti or do you think microsoft could have been created without bhakti or facebook could have been created without bhakti it an utter consumption in an idea that is only bhakti you are consumed by it to an extent that you don't care whether you are eating sleeping so we are understanding the word wrong how would you bring this kind of bhakti to say dancers of today um i'm talking more about say upcoming or learning dancers more than established ones who have already have their own path that they've decided how would you translate that bhakti into two ways there are two levels we can go to one is very practical in how you describe bhakti in your dance the second is the say, a higher plane where you talk about the passion of bringing the art in both these planes how would you explain how to go about to an upcoming artist or a young artist I think first of all young artists need to also understand one thing is that um don't get into boxes don't get into comfort zones you know don't get into okay this is my forte my left side profile is better than my right side don't get into this whole business don't make it a commodity don't think that you can package your craft better therefore you can sell your craft better if you can get out of that principle the rest will follow because if you're not spending time doing packaging if you're not spending time looking at yourself and seeing which angle you look best body is definitely that's a medium it's very important i agree i mean i'm not saying you should not worry about it you don't if you don't obsess about it then what is left if you want to do something then you probably study something about your craft then probably you'll start reading up then probably you'll start to connect what you're doing to the text to the music to the idea poet ideating when i when you know he was writing this jaydev ashtapadi what was in the mind of the poet you may come at come to a wrong conclusion but that's fine because it's your you interpreted it like that but you have to let your mind wander it you let your mind interpret the idea because if all the shavataras had to have the same depiction then there won't be 15 poets writing 100 dashavataras each dashavatar is different because how is it different avatars are all the same so for every narsimha avatar if i am jumping out of the pillar and i am tearing hiranyakashapa then what is the difference between this dashavatar and that dashavatar there is something which is different between the two if you see jayadeva's uh, dashavatar it's totally different from every other dashavatar you would have ever read to be able to understand that to be able to look for the differences i think that is very important for the younger dancers to do younger dancers have to understand that they are one in a throng today there are thousand who are as good as you who are as fit as you and who can perform up to your optimum capacity is going to make you stand apart that will give you the bhakti that you want what is going to make you stand apart is how you interpret how you understand how you perceive how you 
follow it as a passion that is going to make you stand apart otherwise yeah welcome to the throng you know welcome to the uh, group anyway lots of us around so right. beautifully put because i think uh, that is true we are just lost in the crowd and uh, you know what you learn and what you interpret is what makes you the other question that i wanted to ask is which is often asked or often uh, is comes as a complaint is that uh, traditional arts or uh, traditional classical arts is very rigid it doesn't have a flexibility i am not able to introduce whatever i want into traditional arts why don't i introduce even if it is new adavas mudras new ways of dancing uh, why is traditional arts so rigid what would your thoughts be on that first of all i think there are two things here one traditional art is traditional art now in every country in any country you see you look at their folk forms or you look at their theatrical forms the traditional format is the traditional format they preserve it as it is nobody is in a race to change that nobody wants to create a new version of the japanese uh, you know they have their traditional form or even beethoven or beethoven or korean uh, you know they have so many of their traditional theater which they do they have this masked dances you know wh- what is this problem we have what why do indian practitioners of the art forms or even the critics of the indian art forms keep talking about how we need to keep introducing new things into this whole format of traditional dance why do you need to do that traditional art form it has a grammar it has a content it has a certain format which has been decided for it now that format has been created on the basis of many things it's been created on the basis of the philosophy of your soil the philosophy of your land the culture of your land beliefs of your the belief systems of your land the knowledge systems of your land this is all reflected in that format so why do you want to change that if you want to innovate the shastra always gives you that leeway the nat shastra itself says these are some ways of doing it. if you have some other way please go ahead now just because you say rama krishna or you say something like that immediately we don't have to develop a mental block if you take away rama you take away the word krishna and you put some sudhir over there it will still be relevant that story will still be relevant to you as a value system as a reflection of your idea as a reflection of your ideology as a reflection of your land because we are saying rama krishna you have a problem if i said sudhir and uh, kamala you think it's a contemporary theme so the block is not coming from the tradition the block is coming from the people the block is coming from the idea that if something is traditional then it has to be rigid I mean, what is outdated about falling in love what is outdated about doing good things what is outdated about emotions about you know motherly love or you know two brothers having a fight or two sisters having an argument or you know two lovers fighting between themselves what is outdated about this nothing i accept that dancers have to make an attempt to put this across to the people they have to tell them look this is communication and this is how we are doing it now you don't have to worry about whether i'm using vibhishana or subhadra or ravana you look at the whole idea understand it as an idea but that the dancers have to communicate it becomes irritating if the dancer stands there and keeps saying this is a great divine form and that you the youngsters may not relate to it relate to it you know because you are patronizing them you're telling them look what you people are following is all shallow that you people are fickle and i am going to give you the good stuff and you better listen to me that's your attitude towards them why should they listen did we listen to anyone i mean which generation listens to another generation nobody everyone has their own ideas today even i will probably not agree with the generation who's in the 70s who say that only in this way you must do something probably i will also not agree with it there may be several ways in which you do the same thing classical format itself gives you the freedom to innovate but how you make use of that freedom how sensibly how smartly you make use of that freedom it depends on your intelligence the intelligence of the choreographer the intelligence of, of the performer just because you are putting a normal name and not a god's name doesn't make the your content very something very new the idea is still the same the idea is still the same the idea is still the same 
and it is an art form it is meant to elevate it's not meant to inform you only you look at any form you look at western you know you look at european drama exemplary people should be the heroes and the heroines that is their prerequisite why why can't you make a drama about some common guy because it is supposed to be elevating you as an art form otherwise it's not an art form an art form should tell you like this is how you should be it is supposed to take you to a different level it is supposed to elevate you mentally you know psychologically emotionally it is supposed to take you to on a high and that will not happen if you are just talking about the boy next door that is why the rules regarding the heroes the heroines who should be the hero of a drama who should be the heroine they are supposed to be extraordinary people whom you are looking at they are almost like role models they are role models they are role models and that is art that is art anything which is high which is elevated which is something which you want to look up to and which you want you want that thing to take you away from your daily problems you want it to take you away from the mundane activities the problems the struggles the strifes of your common life it should take you away from there not take you and drop you back into that pit you are experiencing problems here in your life that same problem is being reflected on stage how does it elevate you unless you have a fabulous solution to it hmm. there so why do you want to drag something which is very high and bring it to a lower level level and then you call it progressive how is that progressive you are actually taking away the beauty of the thing you are taking away the beauty because you are taking away the exaggeration and exaggeration gives it the beauty but if i am talking about a beautiful plant and a creeper and you know a beautiful stream and i am talking about something which is very evocative yeah. and aesthetic then it will take me away from the reality of my life you know dinning the reality into you it's supposed to be letting you face reality in a more um philosophical way that is what it's supposed to be doing to you so how is it how is it rigid then because it's taking you on a roller coaster of an emotional experience and an aesthetic experience and anything that is rigid can't do that you are unwilling to open the horizon of your mind in order to take in the ideas you want to make it a physical thing you want to look into the physicalities is this rama okay i'm not a, i'm an atheist so i don't believe in rama therefore this is rigid forget that it's rama think of him as somebody else think of him as a very handsome man you know who's perfectly proportioned who's a great warrior why are you obsessed with the fact that he is rama rama is a medium that the traditional art has chosen in order to tell a story of great value so instead of looking at the story you are only worried about oh I, i don't believe in the ramayana because you have not reached the level to believe or disbelieve your, your mind is not opened up enough if you have read 10 versions of the ramayana and you have studied it as a concept and as a theory and then you reject one and say okay this is a better ramayana than this then i can understand for dancers what are say five or six topics that you think they should read about it could be even streams like for example if they are doing further studies they might have come across this in universities hopefully but if they have not what are some of the say the subjects uh, or sectors that you think these days dancers should concentrate on or at least give enough uh, time and energy for it i think first of all language primarily if you are a southern indian you practitioner of a southern indian dance style then it's imperative that you have a working understanding of your vernacular of the language in which your literary pieces are written sanskrit and the vernacular maybe tamil or telugu you have to have more than a working knowledge of these because the entire syntax of the language changes when you translate it's great to translate but it's a big handicap when you cannot understand the original So I think you must have a basic command over your vernacular preferably Sanskrit and the English language all the three to read and write your language is very important right first of all secondly yes knowing the shastra to some extent the nat shastra or your basic books like abhinay darpana or one or two of them which is actually used in your dance is very important literature try to read as much literature as possible based on puranic idea based on legends or epics written in the country a working knowledge of the ramayana mahabharata and bhagavata is very important because these are where the stories are culled from or the ideas are culled from if you want to do manodharma or if you want to do spontaneous acting first of all you have to know the stories 
in order to be able to do them from the story you can build anything you may take an absolute absurd situation but it has to be based on something for that you need to read allied streams that is you need to know about philosophy or the streams of philosophy that influenced the artistic traditions and you must know literature and language these are primarily important fields if you know music great so i think every dancer should learn music also because you must understand the raga the tala all the aspects that go into structuring your piece that you're going to dance you have to know those components and when i say music i mean the melodic and the rhythmic components both tala and the raga aspects you need to know them because i mean whether you like it or not dance is a comprehensive art form it has all these components and definitely you have to be more equipped than anyone else you have to know what it is required at there. least a working understanding at least a working understanding what are the basic talas what are the permutation combinations what are the basic ragas what is a raga mood what does it create how it is applied to your piece of literature so i think literature music philosophy and legend these four are absolutely allied and components of all four only comprise dance thank you so much for taking so much time off i know that there's much more that i can talk with you but as a start and thank you for giving